Hello fellow truth seekers, this is Barbara Jean. Um, just a couple of things that are on my mind. Um, I want to talk some more about the 144,000. They're quite an interesting group of men who are going to show up in the last days. Um, <clears throat> um, I haven't had any dreams. I've had dreams. And some of them I think were quite profound, but I, when I woke up, I couldn't remember the details. So something's being hidden from me. I don't know what it is. Something is, something's being hidden um, from my understanding at the moment. So until I, until I actually get a conscious, conscious remembrance of my dreams, then uh, I'll let you know. But at the moment, I'm having dreams, but they're all kind of hidden from me at the moment. Okay. Um, in the meantime, I want to go over just a few things that are on my mind. Um, <clears throat> just there's some thoughts that are that are happening, and you know, some things I'm thinking about. Uh, not all just one subject. Like I said, I'm thinking about the 144,000, but I'm also thinking about um, the the virgins. Um, some things that Jesus said about the virgins. Um, <clears throat> And that there are two kinds of people, you know, it's just some misunderstanding that I think, you know, we as the church, we've all been told these things and we've made assumptions about things. And so we assume because we've made these assumptions that it just builds and builds until we have a whole foundation of, of our doctrines and ideologies that have actually been built on assumptions um, or lies or deceptions depending on the uh, attitude of the one who originated it. And if <clears throat> if you think about it, we, we are all dealing with mis mis miscommunication or deliberate lies and deceptions that we are trying to sort through and make sense of. And if it doesn't make sense, then it's probably because it's not true. Okay, because God makes sense, and if we can get that our, our mind around it, the mysteries are because our spirit has our spirits have been corrupted, our souls have been corrupted, our DNA has been corrupted. I get this little piece of paper that I have. Our DNA, our chromosomes have been corrupted. So therefore, when it comes to the things of God, when it comes to understanding. The things of God, male and female, <coughs> we will get things mixed up. There's all there's to it. So when we read the scriptures, our mind is because our mind's trying to make sense of things, and so it doesn't make sense to our corrupted DNA. And so we've got to work around it. And we start adding and we start making assumptions and blah 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 blah. And before you know it, it snowballed into this huge <sighs> avalanche. That has to be sorted out at the bottom of the mountain. And I think that's what's really going on. I think we have an accuser. His name is Satan. He's in the heavenly realms right at this moment. Accusing the brethren. What is he accusing the brethren of? Well, the sins that we are participating? Yeah, that's part of it. I think that's not the main part of it, though. Because he is a liar. Satan is a liar. And, and how did he um, destroy mankind? With a lie. He destroyed mankind with a lie. He uh, took away our dominion of the earth. He took away our hopes and our dreams and our ambitions and things that God had planned for us. He took them away with a lie. A simple truth is that it was a lie. And we believed a lie. So what is he up there accusing the brethren of? Our sins? That's part of it. But mostly I think it's the lies that we believed. We have believed lies. Therefore, what is God doing right now? He's sorting out the lies from the truth. What did Jesus keep saying over and over and over and over again? I came to tell you the truth. Truly, 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 I'm telling you the truth. I'm telling you the truth. Listen to what I'm saying. So he's sorting out the lies from the, the truth. He's trying to sort out, help us to be able to take the clues, take the message. Some some messages are really blatant and out there and easy to read and understand. 
uh, like abstain from fornication and different other things. And others are more subtle that are um, given to us in parables and tales and and um, subtle little hints and this and that and everything in order for us to what? Because he's hiding he's hiding these deceptions from from Satan. He's trying to, what's the word? We have an enemy out there who wants to deceive as many people as possible with lies in order to what? To control them, to destroy them, to steal their destiny, to steal their future, to steal their hopes, their dreams. And that's his goal. And he's up in the heavenly realms right now accusing the, the brethren, accusing us of the lies that we have believed. We have believed the lies. And that's what's keeping us in bondage is the belief of the lie. And there's a lot of lies out there right now. And we know that there's a lot of lies. Uh, um, the deceivers out there uh, telling people, you know, you can change your pronouns, you can change your sex, you can change this, you can do this. And they're all, of course, we all know they're lies. But unfortunately, look how deeply damaged people are if they can actually believe something like that. They can look at their bodies and see male genitalia or female genitalia and know that their chromosomes are X and Y for men and X and X for females and still believe that they can actually change their DNA. That's how damaged we are to be so corrupted that we have fallen for the father of lies and he has people in so much bondage. And it's the truth that sets people free. And unfortunately, we have a lot of people in the churches now. We're seeing this on the news. We're seeing this all over the place. People in the church, not Jesus' church, obviously, their own church, the one of their own making, obviously, telling lies and the people just falling for it because they don't know what's the truth because they're not teaching from the Bible anymore. They're teaching their own philosophies. They're teaching their own, we can be your own gods kind of thing and make up our own rules kind of thing. So I'm just saying, what Satan is up there accusing the brethren of is what? Lies. The lies that we have believed. And this is what every nation is facing. The lies that they had, the corruptions, not just the sins that they're involved with, but the, the actual lies that they believe. And in order for the church to be free, we have to sort through the lies, the assumptions, the things that we believed were true, but are actually not true. That has kept us in bondage to Satan's um, control. That's all there's to it. In order to be set free from Satan's control, you have to change your mind. You have to let God change your mind from the old things, the things, the traditional things that... Well, this has always been a tradition. Our church has always believed this. We were, my, my parents taught me this, blah, 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 blah. And on and on it goes for generation after generation. And we don't understand that those are the very things that are keeping us in bondage. Because we're not looking at the truth and trying to sort through the truth. If it doesn't match scripture, then, then if it doesn't match scripture, then it's a lie. Okay, that's all there's to it. Jesus came to tell us the truth in order to what set us free. The truth sets you free from bondage. So, there's a lot of things in the church, in our traditions, and in our families that we have believed that have, we have, were based on assumptions that have kept us in bondage. Okay, one day there's going to be a, when the church, and it doesn't have to be everybody, but there's going to be a group of people who will suddenly go, oh, and they'll be completely free. And from the traditions and the lies and deceptions and the assumptions that we've all believed, one day they're going to be completely free. And it just takes one. It just takes one. So let's hope that you're that one or you're part of that group. So that's why I'm here for. The Lord is doing the brain surgery, people. The brain surgery hasn't stopped. The brain brain surgery is continual 24 hours a day every day of the week for the last 12 plus years um and it is it's hard work it is really hard work i'm not saying this is easy this is really hard it's almost killed me a few times there are some times when the brain surgery was so intense or so painful so irritating 
And there were times when I didn't want to look at what the Lord was trying to show me or I was resistant because this is hard work. It's hard work. It is hard to change people's minds. Once they've got something stuck in their head, once they've been indoctrinated into something, some, once something has been a tradition that's gone on for generation after generation, it's really, really hard to unlock it. It's really, really hard to dislodge it. It is hard hard work. I can understand the frustration of Jesus trying to talk to the disciples and the apostles about these things and they're going scratching their heads. I don't get it. And he's probably feeling like, I want to knock your head against the wall so that I can get some sense into you guys. But the thing is, it takes Jesus being patient and loving and good as he is, much more patient than me. Um, this is, this is, you know, this this is it's frustrating. It's frustrating work. And it's frustrating for me because I'm having to deal with it. I'm having to deal with this brain surgery. And it it's frustrating to me because it's painful. Sometimes it's downright painful. Literally. Um, so anyway, I'm yattering it on and going on and on and on about some things. But let's just let's just look at some of the assumptions, some things that I just want to knock my knock some people's head against the wall against you know some things that have just been so irritating and the assumptions that we've made. There's this camp of it. We're saved by grace and not by works in the camp, you know, and and they they ignore most of the scriptures and they base most of their theology on one scripture. I think it says, "You're saved by works, not lest any man should boast." Not by works, lest any man should boast, and they base their whole theology on that one scripture. Let me see if I can find it. I don't even, I didn't even cue it. Uh, and they ignore the rest of the scriptures. They re ignore James. They ignore Hebrew. They ignore Jesus. They ignore everything that says that faith, you're saved by grace through faith. Faith is works. Faith is, you know, like I said, it's, it's, it's the stubbornness. It's the rebellion. It's disobedience. Jesus said, if you love me, you will do what I commanded you to do in other words you will change your mind you will have a change of attitude and you will therefore when you change your attitude you will change your actions jesus expects that it you know we're saved by grace but if you're saved by grace that attitude of gratitude will change your actions to say okay you know what god did this for me therefore i'm going to change my attitude about this Jesus didn't like this. God doesn't like that. Therefore, because of, out of gratitude, Jesus saved me. Out because, Not because I was worthy of being saved, but out of grace, he saved me. Therefore, I will do this. God expects, God expects us to have a change of attitude. God doesn't expect people to say, okay, well, I'm going to say the sinner's prayer. I'm going to be saved by grace and then go about our lives as though nothing has changed. If you haven't had a change in your attitude, a change in your life, something is altered inside of you, you're not saved. That's all there's to it. You can say the sinner's prayer every single solitary day. And if you go about your life and nothing has changed in you, your heart hasn't changed, your mind hasn't changed, your attitudes haven't changed, you are not saved. And if you can, if you look down to it, you can say, well, saying the sinner's prayer is a works. So therefore, you can't be saved by your works. So what, saying the sinner's prayer is not going to save you. <clears throat> look at it that way. If you're saved by grace and grace alone, then you shouldn't have to do anything. But you're saying, well, you have to say the sinner's prayer. Well, that's a works, people. In other words, you're doing something in order to receive something. God said, uh, was it James who said, uh, show me your works by, without, with, show me your, 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 your faith without works. And I will show you my, my faith through my works. The same thing with the book of Hebrews. It's all about people who were saved because they believed Jesus. And as a result of believing Jesus, believing God, they did something. They had a change. They did something. Noah believed God when God said, I'm going to save you. Great, God. I'll sit by and watch you do it. In the meantime, I'm going to carry on in the world as like I always did. No, God said, I'm going to save you. You, in order to be saved, you have to 
what? Build a boat. You have to do something in order to be saved. Abraham had to get up and leave his homeland in order to what? To be the father of many nations. In order to be saved, he had to do something to prove to God that he actually believed what God said. What is it? The faith, the faith chapter, is it? With, it's in Hebrews, I know that. Let's see, which chapter is it? Ah. Let me find it. Melchizedek. Faith. Christ. By faith. Uh... This is Hebrews 11 and Hebrews, Hebrews 11? <sighs> it was 11, 1. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by the elders... For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word word of God, so that things which are seen were not made by made of the things which do not that which do appear. In other words, because God has faith in his own abilities, through his word he was able to do something. He was able to create the word world through a word because of his faith. His therefore his belief in himself, was able to do something. Make sense? If Jesus, if God didn't have faith in his own ability, how could he have created the world? His faith allowed him to be able to do something. It changed his, his attitude was such that he was like, I, I'm God, I can do whatever I want. I'm going to create the world with a word. B, hey world, B, bang, and there it is. The big bang. Through faith, his, his, his belief in himself was able to create something, to do something, because if he could have said, well, I'm God, I can do whatever I want, and then not do it, would show that he didn't really have faith in himself. <clears throat> Make sense? In order to have faith, you have to do something. And there's a lot of people who say, so I, have, I believe in Jesus, I believe in God, and yet they do nothing to prove that they actually have faith. You're saved by grace through faith. You're not saved because you are good enough to get to heaven. But if you are believing that God actually saved you, you will do something. You will change your life. God, You will allow God to change your life. You will change your attitudes towards God, towards your fellow man. You will that attitude will change the way you walk, the way you talk, the way you act, what you think, what you do. Because that's what that's what belief and faith does. Okay? It doesn't have any other action. It cannot do anything else. If you believe something, you will do something. If you don't believe that God actually saved or God that actually is and that you you have this great grace to and you actually believe God and believe Jesus, then if you didn't believe him, then you won't do anything. So there's people saying, I'm saying this in his prayer, and then they don't change, which is actually a show of faith that they don't actually believe God. Okay? They don't really believe in this. They're just saying it for, you know, hey, good looks. People 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 heard me say the same as prayer. Now I can do this and this and this and in in their in their though well, they're Christian. Well really are you? If you haven't changed your life, you don't haven't changed your actions, you haven't changed it's all for show. It's just a show. And there's a pe there's people out there who are just in the church for show or because it's good business. They don't really believe the scriptures and they haven't changed their attitudes about, about God and their, or their fellow man. They haven't changed. And you know it, that they're tares among the wheat. They're tares among the wheat. They haven't changed. They're just there for show. Okay. But faith, real faith, because you have this belief, you're going to change. It's going to change who you are. It's going to change your actions. It's going to change. You're going to do something as a result of it. So let's keep on going. By faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. So what was because Abel believed better than Cain, he did something. What did he do? He offered a better sacrifice. 
His faith was greater than that of Cain's. He did something because he believed in God. He therefore did. By which he obtained witness that he was righteous. Uh Uh-oh. He was righteous. His actions, therefore, were, were accredited to him as righteousness. It, therefore, what did he say? Saved him? It saved him. Because God saw him as righteous because he did something. <clears throat> God testifies of his God testifying of his gifts or his works, the things that he was offering God as an exchange for his belief that he believed God, therefore he did something and offered God a better gift more different, a better works. And by it he being dead, yet speaketh by faith, Enoch was translated that he should see not see death and was not found because God had translated him. For before his translation, he had this testimony that he pleased God. He didn't just sit around and do whatever he wanted and please himself. No, he was pleasing God. Therefore, what God raptured him he was raptured he was saved because of his what his works what but without faith it is impossible let's just read that word this this one is pretty good this is hebrews eleven six. but without faith it is impossible to please him for he, he that cometh to god must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that what diligently seek him diligently seek him that's a work exactly he's going to reward you and he you will be you will be sanctified and made righteous because of your diligence diligence to seek him and to please him and is it impossible to it is impossible to please god without faith and faith is a belief that leads to an action leads to works So, and this is the New Testament, people. This is the New Testament. Not the Old Testament. This is the New Testament. By faith, Noah, being warned of God, the things not yet yet seen, moved with fear, prepared an ark to save his house by which he uh, which he condemned the world and became the heir of, of what righteousness, which is by faith. So this is what I'm saying. You can read more. Here's about Abraham sojourning, getting up and going when God told him to do it. Um, Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Sarah and on it goes. I mean, you can. this is just the beginning of Moses and all these people who all did something. To prove they actually believed, so there's a lot this this uh, ideology out there that says you're just saved by f- grace and grace alone. You're wrong. It's time to grow up and put that aside and change your mind. Yes, you're saved by grace through faith. Through faith, in other words, you must prove to God that you actually believe. If you are in the attitude of gratitude, and if you actually believe that Jesus did what he did for you, you will change your mind, and you will do the work that God calls you to, and you will walk in obedience. And if you do not, then there is no proof in God's the book of life, your name will be scratched out. Your name will be scratched out. Okay, she said this in his prayer. He said this in his prayer. Let's see whether they change. Let's see whether there's a difference in their attitudes. Let's see whether they're willing to diligently seek the Lord and prove to the world and to God that they actually do believe. Okay? I just want to put that aside. There is an, a, there's this camp that's just built on lies and deceptions here, people, and it's time to put it aside. Time to the accuser of the brethren, up in heaven, accusing the brethren of what? Of this very thing. 
the lies and deceptions that we have believed because it's convenient and makes us feel good, tickles our ears, gives us an excuse to keep doing what we're doing and not change anything and have no works, no rewards whatsoever and have your name scratched out of the book of life because you are a lazy, lazy person who refused to change and even seek God in any way, shape, or form. Let's just say. So don't stop stop teaching those lies and stop believing those lies because they're lies. Okay? That's keeping you in bondage. <clears throat> um, another thing I wanted to talk about <clears throat> is this um, assumption that, that all salvations are the same. The um, That there are seven different levels of salvation. I mean, the book of Revelation quite clearly spells it out. Jesus said so. There are different levels of salvation. Not all are saved by the same level of grace. Some are obtain more grace and others obtain less grace. Some are barely squeaking and there's others who are just poor, you know, getting in with, you know, great rewards and, and fanfare and all the rest of it. Again, depends on your works. The works are, are, are your levels of reward. Okay. There's base salvation. There's base salvation, and then there's sacrificial salvation, there's educational salvation, and praise and worship salvation, there's works salvation, right here, right there's faith, that's the heart, the heart of God, the heart of the Father, there's grace for grace alone, but also understanding the gratitude, the attitude of gratitude, right here, that changes your, your way, it changes your mind. Um, this is the salvation through baptism salvation right here. Um, and this, of course, is the Laodicean church who will be saved with facing the Antichrist salvation. But guess what, people? They all, none of us are getting into heaven without some kind of uh, proof that we actually believe. Or it is right there. Look at the book of Revelation. All seven churches must do something in order to what? Receive salvation. You have to do something. The f the first church. Let's just go. Let's, let's just go there. Revelation. I have too many minds here. <clears throat> Revelation chapter. This is the letters to the church from Jesus Himself, <laughs> writing, um, um, giving these letters to John the Revelator, and dictating it to him, the Lord in His glorified form giving these letters to John to write to the churches. The church of Ephesus, the foundational church. The, the church of the law, the law keepers. The Jewish branch, the Jewish, it talks about what? The candlesticks. Who has, who's known for their candlesticks? Well, that would be the Jewish people. I know thy works. That's the first thing he says to them. I know they were, I know your works. It's what he says practically to all his churches. I know your works. That's what he's looking at. He's looking at your works to see whether you actually believe him. You believe God. You prove you're, you're made righteous by your works. I know your works and thy labor and thy patience. I know that they cannot bear them that are which are evil. And thou hast tried them which are apostles and are not. And hast found them liars. So there's, there's people going around saying that they're apostles and they're just liars. And he said, you've proven them. Why? How do they prove them? Through the scriptures, through their deeds, through their works. He, They were testing the spirits through their works and what they were saying. And has borne and has patience for my name and sake and has labored and has not fainted. What it fainted from? From their works. I know your works. This is your hardworking people, your law keepers. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will, I will come unto thee uh, quickly, and remove thy candles to God of its place, except thou repent. They forgot to love. In all their righteous works, they forgot to love. And therefore, God was still not happy with their works. As wonderful as they were and as righteous as they were, they still needed to improve on their what? Their works. They needed to change their attitude. God wasn't just pleased with the outward um, it, it, uh, works 
the things that they were doing, doing to prove their faith in God. He wanted a change in their attitude too. He wanted more from them. So this is just the foundation. This is just the foundational church. All the churches have to do something in order to receive something. And there's different levels of salvation. There are seven different levels of grace. Based on what? On works. Through faith. You're, they're saved by grace through faith. Through their works. So, please. If you are a grace and grace alone person out there, you've got to change your attitude and you've got to stop preaching it because it's a lie. You're, you've got, you've ignored the rest of the scriptures. You've ignored practically most of the Bible for just one verse. Really? Is Jesus only one verse? All the things he said, all the different things. He said, if you love me, you will keep what? My commandments. You will have works. Bottom line. See, let's just put that to bed, okay? Let's put this to rest and and if you hear people saying this, you have to have some proof to show these people to help them to repent and change their minds of this bad theology. The lies and deceptions that Satan is up in heaven accusing the brethren of. Okay? Another thing I wanted to talk about is this the, the virgins, for instance. Um Luke, let's go to the book book of Luke. I've talked about this before, but let's go to the book of Luke first chapter twenty. Chapter 20, uh, about the re the resurrection. Now we've all uh, it'll, uh, we've all assumed, and then assumed we were taught. I was taught that because there's just one resurrection, there's just one salvation. There's only one one salvation, and that's it. And we forgot that there's different. We didn't know that there were seven different levels of grace. In God's kingdom, in His economy of salvation, that we all assume that everyone is going to go to heaven at the rapture. And this is one of the things I was trying to tell you and been telling you that there are, not everyone is going to go to in the rapture. Not all who say, "Lord, Lord, didn't we do this and didn't we do that?" are going in the rapture. What is the qualification for the rapture? The qualification for the rapture is water baptism. You have to be sealed for perfection in order to be taken in the rapture. And I've told you this. But there's also going to be a birth in heaven between the bride and the bridegroom. Because guess what? God is fertile. God has got to prove his his virility. He proved his virility through the Father when he had his only born son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was not a created being. He was God's only born son. Therefore, also God. Okay, because he is part of the family of God. He was born of the Father, up through the Holy Spirit, conceived, being conceived of the Holy Spirit. He is now God's only born son. Therefore, he is God. And he's proved him. He's proven he's, through his actions and things he's done in the way he died on the cross and rose again. He proved he was God. Okay? <clears throat> but he also has to prove more. He's putting all his enemies under his feet. Now, he hasn't done it yet. <sighs> According to the book of Revelation, he's it's it's a progressive it's a progressive uh, um, defeat through each dispensation of the church. He is putting one more, two more, five or more, a thousand more enemies under his feet until he has put all his enemies under his feet at the last dispensation. Okay, so there is going to be a birth according to Revelation chapter twelve in heaven. Of what? The perfect. The perfect one. The perfect comes. Who is the perfect? It's the child that's born in heaven. Jesus and his bride produce seed. They are, they have to. How can you not? Jesus is the perfect bridegroom. He is the perfect man. And he's got his perfect bride, his perfect Eve by his side. That's got to bear fruit. And that is also part of the proof that Jesus is going to defeat, how he's going to defeat his enemies. There has to be, I mean, God is God. God produces seed. God produces perfect perfection. 
And that's what the aim is. And that's how he puts his enemies under his feet. By showing and proving, not just saying, okay, I, I am God, therefore I'm saying this. And then there's no proof. Remember, the accuser of the brethren is in the heavenly places right now, not just accusing us, but accusing Jesus and accusing God. He's up there accusing everybody. Accusing the angels, accusing Jesus, accusing the Father, accusing the Holy Spirit, accusing all of us. Out there saying, you prove it. Prove it. You have to prove it. He's in the courtroom uh, demanding a witness for the things that God says. Okay? Make sense? If God said he can do this, then God has to prove it. He has to, have, he has to work, do some works to prove that he is exactly who he says he is. Jesus came down and there was proof positive right there that God is this kind of God. Just like the, the Abraham who was going to get up and sacrifice his son. God is that kind of a God who would not even withhold his own son, his only born son on a cross for you and I. And that has shut the mouth of Satan to be able to... He can't accuse God of that anymore. You see? God, you're demanding a sacrifice, and yet what are you willing to prove? Well, let me send my son. Well, prove it. No, he did. He did. All through the scriptures, he said, I was going to do this. And what did he do? He did it. He did it. And he's now, he's saying in, the, in, his, in the scriptures, uh, there's going to be a woman. She's going to be clothed in the sun. She's going to be wearing a crown of 12 stars. And she's going to be standing on the moon. And she's going to give birth to this child. And it's going to be the perfect. And Satan right now is still up there waiting for that moment. And he's going to accuse Jesus. And he's going to accuse God and say, well, look at this child. He's not perfect. His chromosomes aren't perfect. He's not perfect yet. How dare you say he's perfect? And he's looking for the moment to devour the child. But God will prove that he was yet right yet again. The bridegroom, the perfect bridegroom who's been made uh, has his beautiful bride who's now made perfect herself. She's now been perfect. How's she made perfect? She's perfect because Jesus is casting out her fears through the things that she has suffered, through the things that the church has suffered for the last 2,000 years. We have gone through our deliverance, through our works, and through our suffering. We are learning obedience, and we're also learning not to fear. Not to fear man, not to fear death, not to fear life, not to fear the death. We are, Lord is casting out our fears through his, with his perfect love. And his perfect love is making us fearless. And this beautiful, perfect bride and the perfect bridegroom are going to bear seed, bear fruit, and bear, uh, bear children. Okay? There will be children that will be born to a new race of people that is going to be eternal forever and ever. And it has to because God is not a God whose um, fruitfulness and, and, and his ability to reproduce suddenly comes to an end at the end of the church age. No, he is bearing children right now. But he, this is an eternal thing because that's the kind of God we serve. He's an eternal, fruitfully, eternally bearing seed kind of God. This is an eternal, wonderful process. Isn't that beautiful? That's wonderful. It's an amazing thing. And this woman in Revelation chapter 12 is the proof of it. Okay? And that's what throws Satan down. Right now, he's still up there. Satan's still up in the, in the heavenly realms accusing who? The brethren. How do we know that? Because you and I are still under judgment. The world is still under judgment. We haven't been raptured yet. When the moment we have come to that place of no longer believing the lies of Satan, we will be set free by the truth that we have believed and rejected all the lies and deceptions of Satan. That is the moment when we are taken up into the heavenly realms. Why? Because God's not going to take a bride. Jesus is not going to take a bride until he's equally yoked with his bride. In other words, she has re re relinquished all the lies and the deceptions of Satan. And until that has happened, Jesus, we're going to stay here until we have learned obedience. Okay? Until we have learned obedience, we're staying put. That's all there's to it. No. 
speak. Keep this in mind. He's not going to allow Satan to, to, to devour his bride with nuclear holocaust. So keep that in mind. The Father, the Restrainer, Jesus Christ, and his masculine energy, he is protecting and hoopling his bride. He's hoopling his bride, and, he, and the bride will be taken when she is perfect. And Satan hasn't got a choice. He hasn't got any. He hasn't got any right to destroy this woman as long as we are baptized believers. The baptized believers are the bride. You you are being hoopled by the Lord. And he's not going to let Satan destroy you with a nuclear holocaust. That's all I'm going to say. Okay. So that's for that's for leaving. So keep that in mind. And it's our faith that is restraining this this antichrist from. Rising up. Now, <coughs> I wanted to go again. What I was talking about was these virgins, that there is different resurrections. And it's a, a scripture. There's more than one resurrection. There's the rapture of the bride first. We go first. We're gone. Then there's a group of people who will be remain behind, and they have to, the virgins have to be protected too. They're also protected by the Holy Spirit, because they have the Spirit of the Holy Spirit, God is going to protect them, but on the earth, because they are not raptured for perfection, they, but they have to remain behind. Why do they have to stay behind? Because if they don't stay behind, there will be nobody to repopulate the earth for the thousand-year reign. They are very necessary. Let's, we just, let's read this, this passage here. Luke 20, starting at verse 26, Luke 20, 27. Then came to him certain, um, certain of the Sadducees, which deny that there is any resurrection. So this is how this, this passage starts. This group of, of very liberal believers, oh, believe, I can't believe call them believers, the liberal Jews, Called the Sadducees, they're the same kind of groups that are going around. We have these liberal Jews and these secular liberal Jews, and we have these very religious Jews, which we call them Pharisees. They're, they're still they're still they're still around people. Uh, but these uh, uh, they're living for today. They're living for the day because they don't really believe in the resurrection, which deny there is any res any resurrection. And they asked him, saying, "Master Moses wrote unto us, if any man." If any man's brother die, having a wife, he die without children, that his brother should take his wife and raise up seed unto his brother. There are therefore seven brethren, and the first took a wife and died without children. <laughs> what? And the second took her to wife, and he died childless. And the third took her in the, in the like manner seven also, and they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife of them is she? For seven had her to wife. Now, listen to the question they just asked. Okay, these seven brothers, these so-called seven brothers, I'm sure it's a lie, took this one woman to, to wife to have children with her, and she died. They all died childless. So now they're saying, in the resurrection, whose wife of them uh Whose wife is of them is she, for seven had her to wife. Now, if you remember, that since there's more than one resurrection, what resurrection are they referring to? The rapture is a resurrection, but it's not referred to as a, is a resurrection. It's actually referred to as a, ra ra a rapture because they are, yes, raised from the dead, <coughs> those who um, are baptized believers, but they are not, they are not, considered dead they're not they're not dead because they've already died when you are baptized in Detroit Jesus Christ as far as God is concerned you've already died you've already resurrected what as far as the scripture is concerned if I should for, should die in the flesh here the Bible only considers me asleep the Bible hasn't has according to the the, the way the God so I can get this out properly because I'm getting excited here According to Romans 6, when you are a baptized believer, you are in the record books, in the heavenly places, as having died. And not only have you have died, you've also already resurrected. Because, remember what faith is. Faith is the, the hope for things not seen. 
you have done something. You have you have done an act of faith for a hope of something that you have not yet seen. That's what faith is. You are going to do something. In other words, you're getting in the waters of baptism because you really believe that God is going to do this. That God is going to do something as a result of you doing something in return. So you're being saved by your works. Because of faith. Because of your faith and because Jesus commanded you to do it, you're going to do something. And in the heavenly realms, this is written down as obedience and righteousness. And also that you have put yourself to death. You are now dead. Let's see if I can find that quickly. Just in case you don't know, go to the book of Romans chapter 6. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that as many of us were baptized into Jesus Christ, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. For we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not sin, live in death, uh, serve, should not serve sin, for he that is dead is freed from sin. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ being raised from the dead, dieth no more. Death has no more dominion over him. Okay, let's go back to the book of Luke. Chapter 20, and this is what I'm saying. When you are a baptized believer, as far as God is concerned, you've already died. And now you are alive. You are alive. And you are no longer dead. I am no longer dead because I'm a baptized believer. Therefore, God doesn't see me as being slated for death because I am not, I've already died. And it's only appointed unto man to die once. Okay, so therefore, there's this group of people asking Jesus about the resurrection. And we know that there's more than one resurrection. According to the scriptures, there's first the rapture, which occurs in Revelation chapter 6, the sixth seal. And you see, this is, a, I've heard somebody just recently talk about how the resurrection is, uh, the rapture of the church is on, uh, is is um chapter three chapter chapter four and it's just not it is it is not please stop saying that please stop saying that it, the rapture is not in chapter four of the book of revelation it is where jesus himself oh, i'll get there in a second i'll get there in a second i'll get there in a second hold on let's just finish this so we have this group of people who will be there's the first the rapture which occurs in revelation chapter 6 the sixth seal which is witnessed by uh, uh, matthew 24 sun moon and stars okay great earthquake sky rolling back as a scroll that's the rapture of the church seventh seal <laughs> before the seventh seal is opened the you see the church in heaven Revelation chapter 7, you see the raptured bride in the temple, in the heavenly places, praising God for their salvation. Okay. Then in, um, but then we know that there's two, re there's two resurrections that occur after this. There's the resurrection of the dead um, in Revelation chapter 20, 20 of the, those who were martyred for Christ during the church Excuse me, during the church age, this is the martyred, martyrdom, those who are persecuted for Christ. And then there is those who are persecuted and, and uh, beheaded during the Laodicean age. Here. And they are participants of the first resurrection. It's quite clear. Read it for yourself. It's the first resurrection. Then there's a second resurrection of the dead. This is the first resurrection of the dead, and this is there's a second resurrection of the dead, interestingly enough. Those who die in Christ or martyr for Christ are still considered dead. They haven't yet come to life yet. They're saved by grace, 
but they're not baptized believers. They are the, the resurrection of the dead. There's a second resurrection, and then this group who also are not in Christ, they are not baptized believers, and yet there's this first resurrection. They're participants of the first resurrection of the dead. Of the dead. Let's keep that straight. That's very important. They're not alive. They haven't been baptized. Therefore, they are not considered alive. They are still dead. Okay, then there's the second resurrection of the dead, and it's quite clear in Revelation at the end of Revelation chapter 20. Now, let me just quickly go there. Revelation chapter 20, the first when the thousand year reign com comes, uh, you see the first resurrection of the dead. Uh, Revelation chapter 20, verse. Twenty verse four, and I saw the thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was given to them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, which had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark on their forehead or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. So this is the first resurrection, but the rest of what the dead, the rest of the dead, these are these people who are resurrected in the first resurrection are considered. The first resurrection of the dead, which is what it says, the rest of the dead, live not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Okay, there it is right there. This is the first resurrection. Blessed in is it ho and blessed and holy is he that hath part in the first resurrection. On sec such the second death have no power, but they shall be the priests of God in Christ and shall reign with them a thousand years. Now we'll go to the end of the book when the rest of the dead are raised to life. Um, this is the, after the millennial reign. Verse 20, uh, verse 11 of chapter 20. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it were, uh, from whom the face of the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place in them for them. And I saw who? The dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. The dead were judged. There it is again. The dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to what? Their works. So there again, if you believe that faith without works is life, you're wrong. You're judged according to, the dead will be judged according to what? Their works. Right there. You're saved by your works. Yes, you're saved by grace because you cannot get into heaven without God's grace. But you're also going to be judged according to your works to prove whether you actually believed God or not. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and the and death and hell delivered up the dead, which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their, what? Their works. And whoever was not found in the book of life was, what? Cast into the lake of fire. So there we go. So there, this is, again, just trying to get to the point I was trying to say, the assumptions that we have made that have left us, kept us in bondage is that there are more than one resurrection that there are different levels of salvation, okay? Same grace, but different levels of salvation according to what? Your works. So, go down to this group of people who were, this group of Sadduc this Sadducees who were trying to tempt Jesus and test him because they didn't believe in any resurrection whatsoever of anybody. And here is, they present this woman to them, to Jesus, and say, this woman is, was married to seven brothers, so whose wife is she going to be in the resurrection? And Jesus is going to tell them about the resurrection of the dead, not the resurrection and the rapture of the bride who is alive in Christ. She's already died. Therefore, God, she's now part of, um, of course, he, Jesus hasn't died here yet. So therefore, they understand. But he is dealing with the resurrection. There's two of them. So this is the resurrection of the dead. And he. this is what it says. Uh, and Jesus answered them. This is verse 34. The children of this world marry and are given in marriage. The children of which world? 
this world, not the children of the next world. You are baptized believers. You are children of the next world. Why? Because we were born again. We were born again and set free from this world. We are children of the next world. So this is the children of this world. Uh, but they which are accounted worthy, in other words, that they have works to be saved, according to this, they which are which are which shall be accounted worthy, how do you count it worthy? By grace, first of all, and so second of all, by your works. That's how they're accounted worthy. So these people, will he's saying, well, they'll be judged according to the works, and if they're accounted worthy to obtain that world, the next world, if they are accounted worthy, if they... We have the works to obtain it. In and the resurrection from what? The dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. So he's what are we talking about? We're talking about the next world. And he's talking about those people who are, are, are resurrected from the dead in the first and the second resurrection. They will, they're children of this world. And in this world, they are permitted to marry and are given in marriage or can have children in this world. But in the next world, the people who are counted worthy to be saved in the resurrection will neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more, for they are, what, equal unto the angels. And are children of God being children of the resurrection. Now, who are we? We're not children of the resurrection who are baptized believers. We are the bride of Christ. And we have already died. As far as God is concerned, we have already died. And we are now alive in Christ and we are one with Jesus, and therefore, if we're one with Jesus, we are now equal with Jesus. We are equally yoked with Jesus. We are given credit for his works. We are given credit for his death, burial, and resurrection, and the things that he did on this earth. We are given credit for it. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. We are bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh, and we become one with Christ, and therefore, we are equal with Christ, not because of our own works. We are not going to be judged, even judged according to our works. We'll be given our reward according to Jesus' works. Now, can we add to those works? Certainly. Most definitely. We are allowed to add to our works and the things that we... But we are given the base, the base reward of Christ's finished work on the cross is accredited to you through baptism. Amazing! Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. That's amazing. A simple act of getting in the water and giving yourself to Jesus in submission and obedience and faith has changed you for a different level of salvation that none of the other churches can receive. That is amazing. So they, according to Jesus, in this, the resurrection, if they are counted worthy, will not be permitted to marry or be given in marriage in the next world because they are children of this world. And in the resurrection of the dead, they will not be permitted to marry and they will be equal to the angels. Quite clear? It's clear. Now that the dead are raised, now that the dead are raised, even Moses shown at the bush when he uh, when he called the Lord God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, for he is not the God of the dead, but of the living, for for all live unto him. That certain then the certain then certain of the scribes answered, saying, Master, thou hast said well, and after that they durst not ask him any questions at all. So now they were like Jesus was saying, God is not the God of the, of the dead. He's the God of the living. Okay? And yet, and that, but this is, this is hopeful because when God judges the dead in the first and the second resurrection, actually the first, the first, the, the first group of people are not yet judged. And I think they've already faced the judgment, basically. Um, the first resurrection, they are not, they're not, they're not, uh, I don't think, I don't believe that they are required to 
face the beam of steep judgment when the rest of the dead are raised. And then they are judged according to their works um, because they've already done it. When they're, they, they've already had their resurrection. They receive their immortal bodies, immortal bodies, and they were raised from the dead. I don't, at least, at least in my mind, the way, the way I think, and this might be, a, and this is an assumption on my part, is that because they've already faced death uh, through martyrdom, God raises them in the first resurrection to assist Him in the um, uh, administration of the uh, millennial during the millennial reign. They are not required to face the um, bema seat, the bema seat judgment, for those who are going to be weighed in the balance. Those who are weighed in the balance, according to their works, uh, at the la second resurrection. Now that's an assumption on my part, but I'm just assuming that that that's the way it is. Now let's go. Let's quickly go there for a second. Uh, Revelation chapter twenty. That's not where I want to go. What else I also wanted to say? I had something I wanted to say, and then I forgot what it was. Um, oh, so even though they're considered dead, and they are dead because they hadn't yet been made, made alive through the resurrection of Christ, their names are written in the book of life. And they don't receive their life in Christ until they have been judged at the judgment seat. Make sense? Okay, so let's go to the end of the book of Revelation, chapter 20. And they are judged according to the works, but their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Even though they're dead, the hope is, and the know, knowing this, is that even though they're written in the book, they are they are dead and raised from the sea of the dead, uh, sea, the sea of dead, and what you think about it, the Dead Sea is in Israel. Interesting. And it's getting smaller and smaller every day. Isn't that amazing? That's amazing. The prophetic, prophetic people, um, that the, um, they have to be, even though they're dead, they can still come to life because God is the God of the living. And God of the living is going to raise them to life, resurrect them, but also write, give them life because their names are written in the Lamb's book of life. Um, uh, chapter 20, verse 11. And I saw the great white throne in him that sat on it from whom the face of, excuse me, from whom the face of the earth and heaven fled away and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. And another book was open, which is the book of life. The book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. Let's just quickly go to Revelation chapter 3, the church of Sardis. The church of the fish. Sardis, sardines. Root word for sardines. The book of the fish. And he says to the book of the fish... Uh, to the letters to the Church of the Fish, the Grace Church. Um, and unto the angel of the Church of Sardis write, These things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God, the seven stars, I know thy works. Again, the first thing he says to these churches, I know thy works. Thou hast, uh, thou hast a name that thou livest, and art dead. You guys are lazy. And you're dying. You're dead. You think you're alive, but you're dead. Just like the rest. Of you're dead. You haven't yet been. You haven't yet faced the death of of the death of burial and resurrection through, of Christ through baptism. And you think you're alive. You think you're alive, but you're actually dead. Okay. Now that's not. It's not the end of the world for them. Believe me, it's not. Although it's a harsh statement to hear right at the beginning of a letter. You're dead. You think you're alive, but you're dead. That's really, really a harsh thing to say. But it's also to know that we know what we know. Their names can still be written in the book of life and be to be judged according to their works to see whether they will make it into the book of life and that their names are there. Okay? Be watchful and strengthen the things which remain or that are ready to die. For I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how thou hast received and hold, heard and hold fast and repent. 
If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come unto thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come unto thee. Now, a lot of these people in the Grace Church hold the thief on the cross as their kind of their their go-to guy. As you know, see, God saved this man. He was a thief on the cross. But look what he had to go through. He was on a cross. He was on a cross, and he was in great pain and suffering. And it's what it took to bring him to repentance. That's what it took to get this man to repentance. His death is imminent death and ultimate suffering and pain on a cross to get him to confess Jesus. Really, is he he's your go-to guy for, you know, the, the guy you look up to? I don't think so. I'm just saying, but God saved him by grace most definitely. But he's not the guy you should be emulating. It's a very sad situation there. Unfortunately, there will be a lot of people who will die on their deathbed and receive Christ, but that's, you know, that's that's God's grace. But is really that the go-to you really want to go to? Is that the guy you want to emulate? Is that really the one you say, okay, this is the guy we should, you know, keep in mind when we are living our life, the thief on the cross? No, he's not the guy you should be looking at. That's not, that's not our go-to guy to emulate. Though has even a few names, even... Uh, and you shall not know which hour come upon me. And Del has a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and how they shall walk with me in white, for they are what? Worthy. Where did we hear that word worthy before? Oh, yeah, those who are counted worthy for the next life. That was the virgin, the woman who had the seven husbands. What? If she is accounted worthy... Because they are worthy, these are people according, judged according to their works. And this is what Jesus says, I know thy works. You think that you're alive, but you're dead. You think you're alive, but you're dead. He that overcometh shall be clothed in, in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. When is the book of life opened? With the resurrection of the dead. What? The resurrection of the dead is when the book of life is opened to see whether your name is there. Even though you have been resurrected from the dead at the, at the beam of seat judgment, the rest of the dead who are in the sea of the dead shall come to life and they will be judged to see whether their name is in the book of life. Revelation chapter 3 verse 5. Then we see in the fifth seal, which represents the fifth dispensation of the church age. And what do we see at the fifth seal, which represents the grace church? We see those who are in uh, Revelation chapter 6. We see the fifth seal being opened. 6, 9. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar of the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held and they cried with a loud voice saying how long O Lord holy and true dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth and this is what the Lord says to them and white robes were given unto every last one of them okay so when did Jesus say he was going to do that oh yeah to the fifth church this church of Sardis which we just read he said he was going to give them white robes. And here we are. They are given white robes. And he said unto them that they should rest for a little season until their fellow servants and their brethren should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. So they have to wait until the rest of the dead die like they do before they receive their reward. But in the meantime, they are given white robes because they were found worthy. What? There it is, people, right there. They'll say. So, not that hard to see, but there's a lot of people who just still won't refuse to see it because they have already got an assumption in, a, uh, a, you know, in their head. This is what they were told. This is the traditions, blah, 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 blah. And they can't see it. They can't see the forest for the trees. They just cannot. You can point it to them, point it to them, but because their minds and the corrupted DNA, they get corrupted DNA, they can't see it. What helps you to see it is baptism. It helps you to see things that you were not able to see before because Jesus is perfecting his bride. We will be equally yoked with Christ when we have removed all the lies and assumptions and deceptions that are in our spirit in order for what to be made perfect 
and our DNA to be made perfect because we are sealed for perfection. But Jesus is not going to take us until every last one of those last lies and deceptions have been rooted out, which is causing us fear. And fear this lies and deception causes uh, and causes fear. That's what's holding us back. It's what's when you believe a lie. That's what ingrains fear into your spirit. It's the fear of judgment, the fear of condemnation, the fear of the it, it, fear is what it, it is is rooted in lies. Fear is rooted in lies. Think about that. Fear is rooted in lies. If you're in fear, then you have a lot of lies that you have to deal with. Your fear is rooted in lies. Therefore, if you are in fear, you must root out the lies that have kept you in fear. Because perfect love casts out fear. What? There it is. Okay. Now, I wanted to go to something else that, that's been on my mind. And I do want to talk about the 144,000, but I don't think I'm going to get to them. And it's the way this is an hour long. In fact, I'm going to think what I might do. I am to stop this video and continue with this train of thought in my next video. Um, that way I can keep it shorter. Okay, I'll talk to you in my next video.